a Tennessee man is struck down by acute and terrifying pains. I had no idea what was happening. Doctors struggle to diagnose the mysterious killer. I feel like his chances of survival would have been probably a year or less. They face one of the most puzzling cases of their careers as they desperately search for the source of the disease before it destroys their patient. Tennessee, December 1997. Starting his day the same way he has for most of his 57 years, Phil Rouse gets a nasty surprise. One of his teeth snaps off at the root. Then another. Well, it was very disturbing for me to have my teeth break like that because I'd never had problems with my teeth before. I went to the dentist, and uh, the dentist was a little surprised that he had noticed some abrupt loss of jawbone as compared to my previous x-rays. With this discovery, Phil's dentist becomes worried about his patient's health. Now, I'm going to touch it here. The thought crosses your mind when you see aggressive bone loss that there may be another condition there that, that we're just not spotting, such as leukemia, diabetes, lupus, numerous diseases such as that that would contribute to it. Concerned, he encourages Phil to see a doctor. The dentist is also perplexed by Phil's behavior. He doesn't seem to be himself. He's always been a very sharp, articulate individual, very inquisitive, and um, we certainly noted a decline in, in his mental state of mind. What could be causing Phil's mysterious symptoms? He looked like he'd been on a slow decline. It, he was obviously, there was something taking its toll on him. Phil's troubles began months earlier. March of 1997, hey, he and a close friend, Kimo Coelho, here, prepare to open an antique auto restoration business. This was my hobby. It's been my hobby since I was about 15. I always loved antique cars. Phil could line up the business. Um, he knew a lot of people who owned old cars. And Kimo was a um, paint and body man. He knew how to restore them. We had about, I guess, about thirty or $35,000 work worth of work lined up to do. And it was all by word of mouth. There was no advertising. It, it, and we saw that we really had something here that it could be a tiger by the tail. But barely a month after the shop opens, Phil is struck by strange burning pains in his stomach and chest. He's fighting for breath. When I opened the business, I was in perfect, perfect health. All of a sudden, I started getting sick. I had such a burning and a pain, and I didn't know what it was. We were worried about him, but we figured if something's wrong with you, you go see a doctor, he diagnoses the problem, you take a few pills, and you're fine. But Phil hates hospitals. And he doesn't want to cause a commotion in the neighborhood by calling paramedics. He asks Gino to take him to the fire station. I took him to the fire station so they could do a heart check on him. Uh, because he really thought that he was having a heart attack. Paramedics check Phil's heart and abdomen, but they can't find anything wrong. They would come back normal, 
blood pressure. The stomach might be a little irritated, but that was all they could find. I would be thinking, what could possibly be happening to him? The paramedics suspect Phil is his own worst enemy. They tell him to start taking better care of himself. I thought maybe smoking was my problem, but you know, if you get any grown toenail, they'll tell you to go smoking. The chest pains subside, and Phil returns to his new business. But he and Chemo need help. They have plenty of customers, but neither knows much about organizing a business. Steve White came over, and uh, he had been our neighbor for 15 years. And uh, I'd always had a lot of respect for him. He said with his knowledge of business and finance, he would be glad to take care of all the paperwork. Phil and Chemo are relieved. They accept Steve's offer. It was a venture that uh, I had thought about for many years. It was a dream I had that I, I thought it was finally going to come true. But just a few days later, the mysterious pains return. I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, my stomach, I've got a burning in my stomach, a real bad burning. And I said, honey, you got to get me to a doctor. This time, Phil has no choice. Josephine insists on taking him to the emergency room. She rushes him to Memphis Baptist Hospital. He says, my stomach is really bothering me and my legs, I can't hardly get them to move. He said, it's like burning, it's burning. And I had no idea what was happening. I had such a burning and a pain in, in the central, right, right in the center of my stomach, I didn't know what it was. As they examine Phil, the doctors question him thoroughly about his sudden pains. I just felt like I was coming to pieces. I explained that I just had to have some help. Like the paramedics, the doctors can find nothing wrong. And as quickly as the violent pains came on, they mysteriously vanish. It seemed like we had no answers. We just, we just couldn't find an answer. And my wife and I both were very, very distraught with it. What they don't know is that there is a hidden killer ravaging Phil's body. Soon after his release from the hospital, Phil discovers he must endure more than just physical pain. Something is affecting his mind. I was on my way to the shop one day to take some pain out to the shop, and I actually forgot where I was going. I, I remember stopping my car, and I remember where I stopped, because when I stopped, I wrote down the location. And uh, I said a prayer. I remember asking God to please get me home and get me out of there. What kind of disease is attacking Phil's mind and racking his body with such violent pain? A few days later, Phil's legs go numb again and searing stomach pains double him over. We were worried about him. He couldn't feel his hands and his feet, and I remember him saying, it feels like I'm walking on a sponge pad. This time, Phil is rushed to nearby Methodist Hospital. He asks to see Dr. Sidney Birdsong, a surgeon who treated him for an ulcer seven years earlier. When I first saw Mr. Rouse, uh, the greatest concern I had was that perhaps he had recurrence of his ulcer symptoms. I thought maybe that, that the scar 
from that previous operation was starting to open up. I said, Doc, I've got a blowtorch in my stomach. Breathe in, take a deep breath and hold it. Dr. Birdsong is also worried about Phil's stress level. Okay, lay back down. He said, well, Phil, I think it might be your nerves or something. Maybe the business and everything is getting to you. Birdsong orders an extensive series of tests. We're gonna get you a we did some blood chemistries which checked his kidney and liver function and that sort of thing, and all of those came back normal. Phil tells Dr. Birdsong about his work on antique cars. Could his mysterious symptoms be the result of something in this work environment? He's been using a new type of paint and painting process in the shop. Certain warnings come with the process. If you're in a paint booth, you don't breathe the fumes. And you have certain masks that you're supposed to wear. Are chemicals seeping into Phil's body, affecting his mind and causing him massive pain? I don't know how much exposure he had to paints, but he was beginning to obviously be frustrated a bit by the fact that uh, I'm sick and I'm having symptoms, but nobody can tell me why. Unable to offer any explanation, Birdsong sends Phil home with no diagnosis and no cure. Nobody knew what was wrong with him, and it had us concerned. What kind of work do you do? We didn't know what to expect in the days to come. He couldn't find anything wrong with Phil uh, that would cause the symptoms that he had. So we were still kind of in a daze. Has some strange virus invaded Phil's body, something his doctors have never seen before? They had little time to find out before it was too late. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Shortly after opening a new business, Phil Rouse repeatedly suffers from mysterious and excruciating pains. I've got a burning in my stomach, real bad burning. I said, honey, you gotta get me to a doctor. Could the stress of starting a new business be affecting his health? Or has Phil's heavy smoking finally caught up to him? His doctors have no answers. Less than 24 hours after his second hospital release, Phil's in an ambulance again, wondering if he'll make it back to the hospital alive. The fear at that point was, was my dad gonna be okay? We really got worried. Uh, we just knew that something was wrong and nobody knew what was wrong with it. Writhing in pain, Phil is again admitted to Methodist Hospital with strange and terrifying symptoms. He really complained of his stomach hurting and his hands and his feet going numb. He was seeing doctors, uh, but it just seemed like it kept getting worse. I, I don't do it. I don't do any of that stuff. The doctors want to help, but Phil's bizarre symptoms baffle them. How long have you been doing that? They don't indicate any disease they recognize. Basically, we were dealing with a gentleman who had abdominal pain and who was not feeling well and not doing well uh, for no obvious uh, reasons. Again, Phil's doctors consider his business. Could something toxic in his work environment be causing the mysterious symptoms? They've been trying out new paints at the shop. Could he be having an allergic reaction? Phil insists that he's never done any painting. That's left to his business partner, Kimo. I don't know how much exposure he had to paints. Uh, I didn't think that that had anything to do with his abdominal pain. Without any clear cause and unable to see a pattern, Dr. Birdsong decides to address Phil's complaints one by one. 
The numbness in Phil's hands and feet suggest a number of frightening diseases. His doctor suspects Phil may even have multiple sclerosis. This is going to be a big pinch. You ready? He sends Phil for a spinal tap. Big pinch, I was telling you about. Okay, you understand? Okay. But when those results come back negative, Dr. Birdsong refers Phil to another doctor for his chest pains. He was sent over to our department from Dr. Birdsong's office just to have a routine screening chest, uh, which we typically do many in the course of the day. A uh, chest x-ray was brought to me. Uh, I looked at it, and it did have an abnormality uh, in the right lung field. Could this finally be a clue to Phil's agonizing problems? I felt at that point in my mind, well, he's most likely got a lung cancer. Other evidence supports Shelton's conclusion. He told me he had been smoking for about 40 years, on the average about two packs of cigarettes a day for 40 years. I think probably at least 90% of the lung cancers we see, the patient does have a smoking history. The mass in Phil's chest is large. It was five to six centimeters. You know, there was a good chance that it may have spread to other organs. Um, when a cancer gets this big, it, there's often involvement in other areas of the chest. He said, I want you to have a CAT scan. I knew then that they had found something. For Phil, even bad news is now better than no news at all. He didn't really appear surprised. Uh, almost relieved in the fact that, you know, I felt so bad for so long. I'm glad finally somebody found out that I do have a problem. The CAT scan reinforces his grim prognosis. I was much more certain that it was going to be a malignant tumor after looking at the CAT scan. I feel like his chances of survival would have been probably a year or less. The doctor breaks the bad news to Phil and his wife. I know you guys have been through a lot of things. He said, I've been in this business many years. And he said, anytime I've seen something like this, it's always been cancer. He said, 99% of the time, it's cancer. I was very distraught with that news. I didn't think I was going to be around to see my grandkids. He said, uh, I think we might have to remove one lung. But before I do, I want Phil to take this uh, biopsy test and to make sure. There's such a high mortality rate with lung cancer. Um, it's very important to determine what cell type lung cancer it may be to see if it can be treated and how it can be treated. Dr. Shelton consults with a surgeon. Looking at the CT scan and the chest film, which were both available, this did appear to be a rather ominous lesion. At that point, we've got more and more concerned about his weakness. There is a syndrome called Eaton-Lambert syndrome, and that involves it's predominantly from one particular type of lung cancer, one called small cell. In some patients, they get a very se severe peripheral weakness. The additional test should reveal what has invaded Phil's chest. We ordered a CT-guided needle biopsy of this lesion, really thinking it was probably lung cancer. Put a small needle through the chest wall into this mass and try to aspirate a few cells out of it. The biopsy offers surprising results. It doesn't show anything. The lesion was successfully uh, engaged, but, the, but no diagnostic material came back, so we still had no diagnosis. But the doctors are still convinced the mass in Phil's lung is a cancer. Different areas of tumors grow at different rates. We, although I'm sure the needle was inside the mass, we may not have been in an area that was actively growing. 
Trying to confirm the diagnosis, Dr. Cole performs a more invasive test, a bronchoscopy. A tiny scope on a flexible hose is directed down Phil's windpipe and into the lower right lobe of his lung. And you can basically examine all of the airways. Again, the results baffle Phil's doctors. Instead of a cancer, they find something bizarre and totally unexpected. We had a very interesting finding because we did get a specific benign diagnosis, and that was a relatively rare one. He had a particular bacteria called actinomycosis. I got a call from the hospital telling me that they had some good news for me, that what they found the spot to be was uh, a fungus in my lung. The doctor tells Phil the fungus can be easily treated. He said, Phil, you know, three months of uh, penicillin treatment will probably clear this up. And we were real relieved because we thought that was, that's what was wrong with him all along. Now he's going to get, you know, treatment and he's going to be back to his old self again. But his doctors still have questions. How did Phil contract such a rare disease? It's a very unusual fungal disease, a very destructive process that invades and just eats up tissues. So it's not typically seen in the lungs, particularly without other areas of involvement. It's almost unheard of for a patient to present with such a diagnosis unless he had been exposed to a tremendously massive dose of an agent. Has some strange virus weakened Phil's immune system, leaving him vulnerable to this rare disease? Or had he somehow been exposed to massive amounts of the fungus? Although how Phil ingested this fungus remains a mystery, it seems Phil's health problems are finally solved. This treatment was carried out for about two months and appeared to be quite successful. The mass got smaller, and we felt that it did, you know, had represented the diagnosis. The spot in my lung had completely disappeared. And my wife and I, and you know, we all thought that I would be getting better. Then, just as things begin looking up, the strange illness returns with a vengeance. And suddenly, his legs were getting numb, and he was stumbling. My ability to walk was getting worse and worse. He couldn't stand anything on his body. He said, when I put something on, it's like burning. It's burning. And I had no idea what was happening. Soon, he's so weak, he can't make it into work. Reluctantly, he tells his partner, Steve White, to take over the operation of their business. The disease is costing Phil Rouse his beloved business. He begins to fear it may cost him his life. After a malignant cancer scare and a rare fungus in his lung, Phil Rouse is struck down again by debilitating weakness and pains. With his life falling apart, he can no longer run his business. It really made him feel bad, but um, there was nothing he could do. He, he just couldn't do anything for the business. He was just backed up into a corner. My main objective was to get well. That was more important to me than the business. But Phil can't stay away. After a few weeks at home, he drags himself to the shop. He's now so weak, he must use a cane to walk. While he's there, Chemo finds an opportunity to vent his feelings about Steve. We just butted heads from day one. I did not like the guy. I did not want nothing to do with him. He knew nothing about the business. He knew nothing about vehicles. 
Kimo and Steve, putting them two together was like a train wreck. They just couldn't get along. Phil tries to smooth their relationship. In spite of his own problems, he still thinks the business can succeed. I would tell Steve that it's important to get along with Kimo. What's wrong? If you can't get along with Kimo, this, this business is not gonna work. But Phil is losing control of the situation. His business is rapidly unraveling. And Steve blames Kimo. And Mr. White would come early in the morning and have coffee with Phil. And he would start complaining about the business. He told me that Kimo was spending too much money on equipment. He wasn't buying the right kind of sandpaper. He was telling Phil that we weren't doing as good as we should have been doing. That we should have been producing more cars. Uh, we should be making more money. And it's kind of hard when there's only one person working. I would ask Steve, please get along with Chemo when you go out to the shop. And he would tell me that he wasn't doing anything to Chemo. He wasn't making Chemo mad. Soon, Chemo starts showing up at Phil's house after work. This guy. I couldn't get Phil to see what Steve was doing, uh, see how Steve was uh, treating us or how he was getting in our way. Um, Steve thought I was just ripping the shop off. And I was very, very upset with Steve about accusing me of stealing. Phil is now caught between the business and their friendship. Phil's personality changed because of me and Steve weren't getting along. He was playing both sides. He was trying to get both sides to, to uh, come together, and they just weren't working. And uh, it, it kind of put a strain on our relationship. And the stress adds to the unbearable strain on Phil's health. He wakes up twisting in pain. I had that severe burning in my stomach and my, my feet and legs and my hands were burning like they were on fire. And I didn't know what to do. I did not know what to do. I didn't have any idea what was going on. And it was nothing I could do. We were taking him to doctors, putting him on bland food, but it was, nothing was improving. It was getting worse. He really thought that he was going to die. And uh, we didn't know what to think. Phil is rushed back to Methodist Hospital for the third time in eight months. I told Dr. Birdsong, I said, sir, please, you've got to get me some relief. Even if you have to put me on some dope, do something, get this pain out of my stomach. Something's got to happen. He quit eating altogether. He couldn't sleep, and he decided that he knew he was dying. Dr. Birdsong is still puzzled by what's causing the burning in his patient's stomach, and Phil's frustration is mounting. Something's wrong with me. I don't know what it is, but please. I said, I've prayed every night. I've done everything I know. Something's got to happen. I've been like this for six, six or eight months now. I can't, can't go on living like this. I said, there's got to be something wrong. There's got to be. He was obviously frustrated in that we didn't have a good reason for his pain. Hoping to finally help Phil, Dr. Birdsong consults with yet another specialist. He had had a previous operation on his stomach, so Dr. Birdsong wanted me to look not only at the lining of his stomach, but also at his anastomosis where he had put the stomach back together. Is the torturous burning in Phil's stomach related to this old surgery? Dr. Acock inserts a fiber optic camera through Phil's esophagus and into his stomach to find out. We can not only get a visual feel for what's in his stomach, but also can take biopsies and do a number of therapeutic maneuvers. After the procedure, 
Phil is sent home to wait out the results. Despite his own physical problems, he is still worried about his quarreling partners. I called out there one day and there was no answer on the phone at the shop. When I got out there, Kimo's tools were gone. And I knew, I knew that Kimo left. With his business self-destructing, Phil drags himself back to the hospital for the results of the endoscopy. We didn't find any ulceration at all. The lining of Phil's stomach is bright red, and Dr. Acock doesn't know why. Could this be the clue doctors are looking for? I did not have a specific answer for him, but I was concerned because I did not think that the degree of inflammation he had in his stomach could account for all of his symptoms. Acock orders an ultrasound. Phil's irritated stomach, along with his weak limbs and considerable weight loss, could suggest abdominal cancer. I was looking for any evidence of malignancy, uh, be it pancreatic, um, kidneys, something in his liver, something along in his lymph node chains. The tests are negative. But when Dr. Acock delivers the news, Phil surprises his doctor. He asks a question that sends the search for a diagnosis in a stunning and terrifying direction. Could someone very close to Phil be a killer? When his business partner abruptly disappears, a desperately sick Phil Rouse collapses from the strange symptoms that have plagued him for months. Where are we going? My feet and legs and my hands were burning like they were on fire. Where do you think I'm being poisoned? Then, after another cancer scare, he reveals new information that may be the answer to his mysterious symptoms. I said, Doc, I, I don't want you to think this is absurd. I said, is there any way you can find out if there's anything foreign in my body, something that shouldn't be there? I don't know what, but anything that shouldn't be there. I said, I feel like I'm, I'm being murdered. I, was, I feel like I'm slowly being murdered. I was fine six or eight months ago, and today I'm near death. And really, I th death is welcome. I don't even care if death comes now because it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad uh, venue to take. Phil has the bizarre idea that somebody's trying to poison him. But his story seems impossible to believe. It was a little surprising. We rarely see even accidental poisonings, much less an intentional poisoning. But Acock is forced to admit that Phil's strange mixture of symptoms now makes sense. He realizes Phil's burning stomach pain and the numbness in his limbs could only be caused by one thing. When you put that together with the early neurological findings and the muscle weakness and the numbness, and then the patient comes flat out and says, I think I may be being poisoned, well, that triggers certain responses. Going to a different part of town? He has him tested for heavy metal poisoning. The test for heavy metals takes a week to analyze. While they wait for the results, Phil's family struggles to believe him. Who could be poisoning him? And how could someone get to him? He's been home for months. They fear his long illness is taking a toll on him. We knew something was affecting his mind. When he started talking about the poison, we were surprised because you don't think of something like that happening to you or someone you know. It always happens to someone else or something you watch on TV. So you want to try to rule out everything else before you come to something like that. We didn't want to overreact until we got those test results back. That night, 
Josephine suddenly realizes Phil is gone. She panics. Gino! Gino! My mom and I woke up early that morning, and I remember looking out the window and seeing the cars there, and my dad wasn't at home. So we were concerned. We didn't know where he was. We had thought initially that he went to the fire station on his own. Frantic. They call the fire station and the hospital. But Phil's not at either one. Now they're worried sick and don't know what to do. Josephine and Gino are relieved when Phil is delivered home safely just minutes later. When they hear what he's done, they are frightened and angry. He tells them that he woke up with a hot, searing pain in his gut, the worst he's experienced yet. I was convinced that I wouldn't make it to see morning. The pain in my stomach had gotten so severe. And actually, to be honest, I didn't want to live. But Phil decides to fight. He vows to stay alive. As I laid there that night, I kept thinking, if I've got enough strength and enough faith in God, I'm going to stay alive long enough to go somewhere and tell somebody what I think is happening. And I think that's what increased my resolve, to stay alive that night. I called the police department. I didn't want to have to have lived 60 years and let somebody get away with killing me. I didn't want that to happen. The car was here within three minutes. I told him, I said, take me to the police station. I want to make a statement to police. I made it out to the car and I said, take me to see the, the man with the most authority. At the police station, Lieutenant Doug Bailey is the detective on duty. Phil came to the police department with a complaint that he thought he was being poisoned. I told Detective Bailey that I felt positively, that I just positive that I was poisoned, that somebody was going to cause my death. And I told him that my wife didn't believe me. And no matter what my wife said, or no matter what my sons or my family said, to be sure and have an autopsy on my body, that if somebody was murdering me, I didn't want them to get away with murder. I want an autopsy performed. It seemed outlandish. At first, it was uh, really unbelievable. I was upset by the reaction of the police because I think they just considered me a kind of wacko. At first, he did kind of sound. It sounded unbelievable. But as we spoke, uh, he started making more and more sense. I was surprised that he had gone to the police so quickly. I would have thought that we would have gotten the results back from the heavy metals tests that Dr. Acock had run, and then we would confront the police. You just left and didn't, didn't tell anyone. Phil's wife is terrified his bizarre accusations will ruin their lives. There's nothing they can do until you've got proof. And he got all down, you know, but he said, I just want something to be done. If I die and they say it's a heart attack, I don't want them to just bury me. I'm in trouble. I'm dying. My wife is mad at me. My son is upset. And I didn't know what to do. I think I was at my wit's end. Phil has reached a point of despair. I seriously considered going to the garage and just putting my dad's old 38 police special in my mouth and just pulling the trigger.
three days later, he gets a call from Dr. Acock that changes everything. When I got the call from Dr. Acock, it scared me. It scared me real bad. Dr. Acock. Dr. Acock told me, he said, Mr. Rouse, he said, I've got some bad news for you. I said, what's that? He said, Mr. Rouse, evidently, somebody wants you dead. He said, we found arsenic in your system. Okay. Well, I, uh -huh. I guess I lost it. I, I said, am I going to die? I said, am I going to die? He said, I don't think the level is high enough to kill you at this point. All right, I'll call the police. Phil's family is finally forced to believe him. My dad was in shock. I remember he kept asking the doctor, am I going to be OK? Do I need to go to the hospital? What do I need to do next? And that's when it really hit home. We knew that at the whole time, my dad was correct in assuming that he was being poisoned. We were shocked, but we were also relieved to find out what was wrong. And then we, ha we, all, we had to figure out, what do you do about this? Where do you go? What's the procedure? Finally, after a year of hellish torture, Phil has a reason for his pain and the proof that someone's out to kill him. But two terrifying questions remain. Who wants Phil Rouse dead, and why? After a year of mysterious illness that brought Phil Rouse to the brink of death. Pain in my stomach had gotten so severe. To be honest, I didn't want to live. He finally has the answer. Phil's absolutely sure he's being poisoned. The police are skeptical until they get the results of his urinalysis. It's arsenic. Phil goes for some further testing with a local toxicologist. Like the police, the doctor is unsure what to think of Phil's story. I received a call from a Detective Bailey from the Bartlett Police. He asked me if I evaluated patients for poisoning. Uh, my comment to him was simple. Is the patient mentally secure? Is he, is he all right or is he kind of mentally imbalanced? And he said, no, I, I think the man is probably legitimate. Dr. Merigian takes Phil's hair for testing. He finds that the man is lucky to be alive. Phil has more poison in his body than just arsenic. His test results also tested positive for mercury and um, other heavy metals such as antimony. Well, at that point, we knew we were going to have to pursue a, a criminal investigation against the person that he believes is one that's poisoning. So you've been friends way before We went straight from the doctor's office to the police department. They appeared to take me very seriously, and uh, their demeanor had completely changed from the first time I had met him. How about Phil? Does he have anybody that you can think of? The police quickly determined that Phil's wife, Josephine, has no motive to kill him. My Neither does Gino. Been sick for, I don't know. The next suspect oh, is Kimo Coelho. He admits he was unhappy at work. I was starting to feel a little bit betrayed in, in my partnership in the business. I've seen it going from being a third owner to uh, down to nothing. The police determined Chemo has nothing to gain by Phil's death. But Steve White does. He has a motive. Money. I found out that he had a $100,000 life insurance policy on my life and we never discussed life insurance. Also, I found a, a business contract that we signed where if I died, he would get all of my cash investment, the real estate, my building. It turns out that White's even been telling people that Phil is sick and dying. Lieutenant Bailey gets a search warrant for White's home. 
We took several articles from the house, several jars of powders and mysterious looking liquids. Until we had them tested, we really didn't know what we had, if we had anything. The materials test positive for arsenic, mercury, antimony, and lead. The same poisons found in Phil Rouse's body. Now we've got the man in possession of heavy metals that the average person's not gonna have. So we'd already knew what the motive, possible motive could have been, and now he had the capability. If Steve White was poisoning Phil, how did he do it? I kept thinking, I, I, I kept wondering about how he could have done this, and it, it occurred to me that he had several opportunities. I think of, because I like him. Steve would come and get Phil in the afternoons. Phil, come on, I'm taking you out to dinner. And I said, Steve, I've got supper ready. Uh, oh, forget it. He likes steak. I'm taking him out to dinner. And uh, so he's had plenty of opportunities. We'd go eat. And it seemed like every time we'd eat, I'd get sick afterward. I'd get real sick. And I just put all that together. It all, it became so clear that, that uh, all this was interwoven. Need some more coffee? And Mr. White would come early in the morning. And I'd hear him in the kitchen and I would get up and he would go and uh, get some coffee and get Phil's coffee or Phil had some coffee and he'd say, oh, let me just get it and he'd fix his coffee. Well, I'd get up and come on and sit on the sofa. Well, I noticed when I got up, he kind of left. For someone to do this to you, he's got to know your habits. He's got to gain your trust. And he's got to be the last person you suspect. On January 19th, 1998, Steve White is arrested for attempted murder in the first degree. Phil's mysterious pain wasn't a medical mystery, but an attempted murder. The motive had to have been money because of the $100,000 life insurance and our business property out there could have been sold probably for $150,000. He did something that was very cold and um, very ugly and very cruel to another human being that was supposed to be his friend. In January 2000, Steve White is tried and found guilty of attempted murder, theft, and tax violations. He's sentenced to 31 years in prison. Phil and Josephine still struggle with the ravaging effects of the poison that cost Phil the use of his legs. It has damaged my stomach and the, some of my internal organs. I'm not the same person I used to be physically. And I've learned to live with that. I've learned to live that this was a big speed bump in my life. I don't make plans anymore. Phil doesn't. We found out the poisoning, it's still in the bones. It's in his nervous system. It's destroying it slowly and slowly and slowly. So we don't know what kind of future we have. We don't know what kind of shape he's going to be in six months from now, a year from now. But in spite of the toll on his body, Phil doesn't let the past ruin his life. I was very angry. I was angry and I was full of bitterness. And I guess I, I would like to have harmed him. But I reached a point, and I know my family may think it's strange that I'm even saying this, but although I know that a move has been made against me to take my life, I knew that if I didn't find forgiveness in my heart, even though he never, he's never asked me to this day to forgive him, but I forgave him a long time ago. I never dwell on that. 